Welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Mazzani. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, the webinar today is about getting ready for your first residency interview. Uh, I'm a family physician. I'm a former resident selection committee member for two residency programs. Uh, and I'm also the founder and president of Mary Clerkship's Medical Society. I'm joined here by Mr. Tim Zellinger. He's our operations manager. Um, and he is going to be moderating our uh, webinar here and moderating your chats. And, um, and uh, we'll be answering your questions based on as they receive and he's going to help us with that. Um, American Clerkships is not affiliated with any of the names that you see over there uh, in front of you. And, uh, and uh, you know, a couple of reminders that I would like to go ahead and mention. The YouTube premiere of this webinar is going to be on the 20th of September at 11.30 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. Please make sure that you uh, subscribe to American Clerkships YouTube channel and you'll get notification of that. And then our next webinar is going to be on the 27th of this month at 9 a.m. That's a Friday. We usually do these on a Monday or Tuesday, um, but it's going to be on a Friday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And it's going to be on things to do while you wait on residency programs to respond after you apply. That's been a very, very common question that a lot of our members have been asking. So we figured, why not? Let's go ahead and just cover that and uh, do a presentation on it. So that's going to be really uh, good and fun. You can register for that one at acmedical.org forward slash residency prep. That is going to go up after this webinar. So uh, typical one-on-one -on -one or panel interview prep uh, do's and don'ts. Uh, of course, as far as dress code is concerned, you want to be a business professional. Uh, start of every interview, you want to thank the person uh, or the panel who's interviewing you. And then for each of the questions, don't forget to um, the question and answer that specific question. So a lot of, you know, some of the techniques that, that I like to use is I like to repeat the question as a part of my answer. And if you're asked, for example, what are your three major weaknesses, your response should be, well, my, um, you know, my three major weaknesses are, and then you make sure that you do the same thing for every one of the questions. Some of, um, some of us are, um, sorry, let me go ahead and just mute this. Um, okay, sorry about that. Uh, some of us need to actually do this for every one of our questions um, until we can really focus on uh, developing our own responses and then uh, being able to respond without any, um, you know, without any second guessing uh, our responses. Uh, we want to be wise with both our time and then we want to be also respectful uh, of the interviewer's time. Um, you know, if you remember the first time you ever wrote a personal statement, it was probably very, very lengthy. It probably lacked focus. And then to your most recent one, which is probably one to two pages, about four to five paragraph, much more focus. And and um, that's how your interview is, is supposed to be shaping up as well. So right now you probably want to talk about a lot. You want to say a lot of things, but you want to really go ahead and cut it down to about a minute per answer and no more than three to four components per answer. Um, and then, um, you know, the answers that you give are going to design essentially what the next questions are going to be asked of you. So be very careful in, in how you respond. Um, there, uh, you know, don't ever ask the question that, uh, do I answer a question that you were not asked? Um, you're going to be working with Tim. If you do decide to uh, enroll in the American Clerkships interview prep, you can Google search that. It's on the bottom right. Uh, you're going to be working with different people, either Tim, myself. Our approaches are just a little bit different, and that's okay. That's perfectly okay because then you learn, um, you know, what to do from different perspectives. And so just take that all in and develop your own style. You're not here to memorize uh, how to answer questions, but otherwise you want to go to make sure that you develop your own personality um, and uh, so that you, you give up a really good impression um, and that your answers don't feel rehearsed. Uh, another technique that you could use is you want to write out 10 questions uh, make sure that they're really intuitive. Make sure that they really show your, uh, your strengths and, uh, uh, and then for the programs once you're once at the end, because they're going to ask you, do you have any questions for us? And then, so you write out those 10 questions and then you can reference those and you can ask them those 10 questions. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and cover some of the sample questions, uh, you know, a little bit lower. There is another type of interview that you could be faced with, which are multiple mini interview stations. Um, those are different than, than your reg regular individual or panel interviews. Uh, we see a lot of this in Canada. We're seeing a lot more here in the United States. A lot of our medical schools in the United States use this and our residency programs are starting to, to develop uh, a system like this as well, but they're a little bit farther behind because it takes a lot to develop a multiple mini interview station. 
Uh, and it's a little bit more impersonal, right? But it's much more standardized. So the, the dress code is the same. Um, you know, it's business professional. Uh, at the start of every interview, same thing. You want to thank the person or the people who are interviewing you, and then you want to tackle the multiple mini interview uh, station. So you want to repeat the question at the door, right? Um, you know, there's you know, three different levels that uh, we've um, you know we've identified in uh, being able to do that. Which you certainly can can read. But then the most important thing is that there are different types of MMI scenarios. There's ethical. There's opinion, action, creative, personal, acting, communication, professionalism, critical thinking, knowledge of healthcare systems, standard interviews, which are most likely directed with the program directors. What are all of these? Um, and these, um, you know, we're going to cover some of those, but, uh, you know, you have to first develop your strategy so that regardless of what you're faced with, you're able to go ahead and respond to them. So you want to focus on demonstrating your knowledge um, of ethical issues. Ethical issues and, you know, issues surrounding professionalism are always hot topics. And, um, and, and be able to develop just mentally in your mind what is, you know, what are some of the appropriate boundaries that, that you have set for yourself in, in, in clinical settings and professional settings and you want to respond within those confines. Uh, you want to shake, showcase your confidence in, in making decisions. You don't want to be indecisive. And you want to show your ability to see both sides of the issue. You want to formulate your opinion and then you want to back it up, but you also want to see it from the other side's perspective as well. So you want to be a good judge. Um, and then you want to identify what you believe uh, and be prepared to elaborate on, on your reasoning. So those are the strategies and, and it takes a lot of practice to get there. But for example, um, you know, there could be a scenario, uh, ethical dilemmas or questions about policy or social issues. Uh, the instructions could be described on the door. It's a situation and then um, it asks the candidate to discuss the ethical sh issues around it. Uh, it may follow up with a, another question on top of that. Uh, that would want to see what you would respond if the if the conversation gets a little bit more um, uh, more uh, intense. So, for example, some of the ethical uh, dilemmas uh, would be, you know, if um, if patient uh, if you find a, a you know private health information uh, sitting somewhere uh, and you you find out that it's one of your supervisors that that left them out there. What do you do with that? Uh, and um, you know, so that crosses multiple boundaries, uh, right? And because if you if you if you say something about that to uh, you know somebody in the higher ups, then your supervisor could get in trouble, and then that that may not really fare well for you. So how do you deal with that situation without compromising your ethical values and at the same time protecting the patient and 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 still doing the right thing? So um, you know these MMIs could get uh, pretty uh, they could get pretty intense. Uh, another one, it could be an interaction with an actor. Uh, we've also seen this in a form of standardized patients uh, in USMLE Step 2 clinical skills. And uh, you may need, be required to give a bad news. You may be required to confront the person about a problem or you know, gather some more information. Most of you are pretty familiar with gathering information through histories and, and uh, just kind of being an investigator. Uh, some other scenarios are standard. Uh, interview questions, maybe a task requiring teamwork, maybe essay writing, uh, there may be a rest station. And so, you know, we won't have the time to do all of this, but these are certainly uh, all of the different scenarios that you could be faced with and we can, we can help you prepare. So many uh, interview stations, there are 18 common characteristics, um, altruism, conscientiousness, critical and creative thinking, empathy, emotional intelligence, ethics, health advocacy, for example, resource integration, patient education, continuing as medical education, uh, interpersonal and communication skills, leadership, policy implementation, consistency. Uh, it's about others and no, not only about you anymore. Um, number 10, multicultural competence, acculturation, reverse acculturation, cultural acceptance, problem solving, professionalism, self-awareness, self-initiated learning, sound judgment, teamwork, no patient being left behind, and then being a good negotiator. So these are just some of the common characteristics that um, we see amongst MMI um, stations that, that you could really pick and choose uh, any of these characteristics and incorporate that into your responses. Uh, and, and that's how the practice should go. So as you prepare for your interview, don't just prepare for just a one-on-one, face-to-face, but you also want to prepare for possibly if you're faced with a 
multiple mini interview scenario. Most of the residency programs are going to tell you what type of interviews that there are that they're that they're going to expect you to participate in. But just in case that they don't, be prepared. Here's a scenario, medical advances and ethical issues. What do you see as some of the ethical issues the medical community will face in the future given the advances in medical technologies? Right, great question. Here's another scenario, mother and children not being seen due to being late to an appointment. A resident in continuity clinic is informed by a nurse that a family has arrived an hour late with their appointment. The resident has refused to see the two children because their schedule is already backed up and this mother is frequently late for appointments. The mother is upset that she is being turned away because her children's immunizations are already delayed. You are the upper level resident in the clinic and over here, this situation, what would you do? Right? Great ethical situation. That could be leadership that crosses ethical, that crosses, uh, you know, patient care. So many um, scenarios, physician feeling that is paid for the amount of work is unfair. Uh, a colleague of yours says to you, our healthcare system is broken. As a primary care doc, I'm faced with dealing with an overbooked practice without enough time to address the need for all of my patients. On top of that, the compensation I'm receiving from the work I'm putting in is hardly fair. Now I'm being questioned by the powers that be about how I'm going to fix my practice problems. As you know, has been pointed out, my practice is but a microcosm of the perplexities that a great number of healthcare providers face. This doctor is really unhappy. So the question is, do I compromise patient care? Question is, or should I be more selective about the patients I accept into my practice so that I can maximize revenues? And then third, what about political activism to change the way healthcare is regulated by the government? What do you say to him, right? So these are all the different three questions that, um, that, uh, that he is uh, asking you and then you have to respond. Another scenario, falsified research data post publication. If you find out that the professor with whom you have done research has changed some of the data before publication and the research was already published, what would you do? Next scenario, physician colleague with alcohol problem. You are a physician working at a private clinic with another doctor. You suspect that he or she has an alcohol problem and have seen him or her put patients' lives at risk. What do you do? So, um, in, in any scenario that you're in, whether you're in an MMI or you're in a individual interview or you're in a, in a panel interview, a group interview, there are six ACGME core competencies that I want to make sure that you are constantly keeping in mind. I want you to utilize it, but I don't want you to overdo it, right? Be consistent. Uh, you can download this at, uh, at acmedical.org forward slash ACGME core, and uh, you can check your welcome to America Lurchup's email for the password. Uh, but here's a sample and the six ACGM core competencies, all of our members know that, you know, they're triple P SIM, patient care, practice-based learning, professionalism, systems-based practice, interpersonal communication skills and medical knowledge. And I think that if every day you incorporate this into your, your clinical experiences, you just focus on one ACGM core competency and move forward, you become really familiar with them and then you'll be able to incorporate that into your responses. We'll have some samples and in a short bin, you'll see why. Some of the basis for most of our answers for our MD residents and, and candidates as far as our strategy goes with regards to interview preparation comes from some of the documents that are available directly to you here in public. And NRMP program director survey is one of them. The uh, main residency match um, is results and data is another. And of course, charting outcomes in the match, both for the international medical graduates, senior students of US osteopathic school, as well as U.S. allopathic seniors. Um, and so, again, these are a lot of our basis for most of our answers, uh, whether it be in an interview prep or in our strategy session. So here are some questions in a one-on-one -on -one or even a group discussion panel. You know, tell me about yourself. This is, um, you know, this is one of the most favorite questions and uh, you can really go anywhere with this. And this is really a perfect time to explore your personal and family life and um, you know, and then you can kind of very slowly bring that, bring in your U.S. clinical experiences, and you know, talk about your siblings if you have any kids, uh, and then kind of where did you conduct your clinical rotations a little bit? And you can do this really strategically, uh, really nicely, and uh, and this is a really good question to be able to talk about that. One of the biggest mistakes that people do is that they go, they say, well, they repeat their name. Well, obviously, I know who you are. You don't need to repeat your first and last name. 
Um, but you could say, you know, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate the opportunity. That's great. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Remember, you want to kind of repeat the question just so that you stay on point. Uh, you know, uh, I was born in, in Tehran, in Iran, and, uh, you know, I have, I have a sister. Uh, she is also a physician. And, uh, you know, we, we moved here to the United States when I was 14 years old. And then, so you kind of go like that. And so I, you notice that I didn't say, well, my name is Pedro Mazzani. I went to medical school at St. Matthew's University School of Medicine. I did my residency here. All that information is there. Tell me about yourself is asking to see if you are the type of person that I can get along with you. If we're just sitting somewhere at a dinner table, just trying to have fun. That's what that tell me about yourself is supposed to do. But it's also a trick question because most of the people drop their guards really quickly. Right? They either keep them really, really high and they only keep it academic or keep it medical or some people just drop their guards and they start to say everything and they answer a lot of questions uh, that they were not even asked. Keep it to three or four components. Where I was born, I have a, you know, my sibling. When I came to the United States and then from there, I can, you know, I can fast forward and say academically, you know, and then I can talk about my clinicals just a little bit. So that's the way that you, uh, you, you talk about yourself. And then at right around, that's about 60 seconds. And at that point, you kind of, you know, that you're at your number three or four, then I put you just kind of stop. And then you say, let me know if you'd like me to tell you a little bit more about me. And then you just pause and there it is. So tell me about yourself. Next question that we, you know, that, that they like to ask a lot for those that have graduated from medical school abroad. What is the difference between the healthcare system in country A and the United States? It's really a good opportunity to identify your clinical experience in the United States again, right? The mistake here would be to overemphasize on how healthcare is done abroad. The idea here is for you to direct the next question towards the areas that you want to talk about. And what really matters is, yes, they, they may be interested in how medical, you know, healthcare is practiced in, in India or in Pakistan. They may, but they're a lot more interested in making sure that they're bringing on somebody who they're not going to have to worry about their patients' lives being in danger, right? So by asking you how healthcare is different between the two countries, they really want to see how well do you know about the healthcare system here in the United States? Because if you don't know about the healthcare system in the United States, good enough, you won't be able to draw parallels or draw distinctions between the two, or your response is gonna sound really, really silly, and it's gonna make you look very unfamiliar. That's the reason why your clinical experiences in the United States are so critical in a, in a question like this. Um, uh, and then uh, this will also, uh, again, you wanna keep this to no more than 60 seconds, limited to three or four components. Don't try to talk about every difference between the two countries. And then just kind of think about it right now. Maybe you should subscribe to podcasts that that uh, <clears throat> that address U.S. healthcare system. Just you know, go online, look at Medscape News, look at WebMD News, subscribe to those so that you're, you're kept abreast of some of the latest uh, events in U.S. healthcare. And uh, so don't just you know, shut out when you see news about U.S. healthcare and abroad, read both so that you can, uh, you can constantly stay up to date uh, because they can very easily turn this question around, right? They can very easily turn this question around and um, make this about, do you know any of the latest uh, news about US healthcare, right? Or even global healthcare. Uh, so you, they wanna see how much do you know outside of US MLEs and, and possibly even outside of uh, even clinical experiences, right? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Uh, another question that is we kind of touched upon in the beginning, do you have any questions for us? Avoid generic questions. Uh, for example, what is the typical schedule for a PGY1 intern? Uh, are residents allowed to do research? Uh, your question should be very intuitive and it should be very personal. And the more creative and comprehensive that your questions are, the more memorable you will be in your residency interviews. I still remember a handful of people that we interviewed that they had some really, really good questions, right? When those individuals actually went back and did research on every person that was going to interview them and asked them something personal about that individual. Those were, those are really, really memorable interviews. It's tough to do that for everyone. You won't know who everybody is that is going to be interviewing you under most circumstances. And, um, and sometimes it could be a little bit creepy if you know the background of all eight people that are going to be interviewing you 
could sound a little bit rehearsed, but it's okay to do it on one or two of those individuals. Maybe on really key people, program directors, right? Associate PDs, they, they, they have all of their work published out there and their name is out there and they like to talk about the work that they do. That's why they do it. And, uh, and if, if, if their interest aligns with yours, then what a great question to ask. And, and that's why it's really good for you to go ahead and come up with 10 questions, maybe if it's not even that personal to individual, but just 10 questions about what the program stands for, uh, what it is that you are, that what, what your moral values are, and what your mission is in life, and then uh, be able to come up with those 10 questions. And then just cross them off as you ask them. And sometimes you can ask the same question two or three times, right? But don't leave a, an interview not having any questions. Don't leave an interview asking very, very basic questions. Remember, you're applying for, you're being interviewed for one of the most important jobs in the world, which is to save lives, to make people better. Right, so there's a lot of responsibility there. So make sure that your questions show the level of emotional intelligence, the level of experience that, that they're looking for, that you're, they're bringing somebody on that is gonna be an asset and they could tell by the way that you think, by the way that you ask your questions. Some of the post-interview do's and don'ts. Um, if you do sign up for an American Clerkships interview prep, and even if you don't, uh, we'd love to hear back uh, some immediate feedback about your questions so that we can help you strategize. We, you know, if you're an American Leaderships member, there are office hours, online office hours, both with, you know, our career development team, with myself, and uh, and we like to talk about these things, and it helps us stay sharp. It helps us modify the the, the approaches that we have uh, because things change all the time. Five years ago, we weren't preparing our members this way. Uh, you know, we just have to constantly stay on top of things, uh, and then so as we hear what happened, then we can help you strategize, and it also helps us as well as a society. Um, remember that the interview does not stop when you leave. The interview does not start when you get there. Your interview started the moment that you apply to a residency program, right? They have all of your information. Some of the programs are really good at doing a lot of investigative work before they invite you. They may be checking your, uh, they may be checking your social media page. There are programs out there now that just simply by email, it can go back and, um, and uh, see, show them where all of the, 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 the social media accounts that you have, what are your usernames. Uh, so make sure that you check your usernames and uh, and then after you leave same thing your interview doesn't stop there You've got to really optimize that opportunity that you had which is what we're going to cover when um, You know we're going to cover in our next webinar What do you do while you wait for residency programs uh, to respond back to you after you apply? That's there's a lot of things to cover there. You want to um, <clears throat> You want to make sure that you go to the program director survey by NRMP It's the same file that I, I talk with every one of our members about uh, But then there's a section that I typically don't talk about which are factors uh, that program directors use in ranking Applicants we usually don't talk about that. So go to that right now after this uh, Meeting go to the program director survey go to NRMP's data and and, and, and uh, I think so data and results uh, or, or research and then from there scroll down go to residency go down to uh, program director survey open it up look at factors that they use for ranking applicants and look at the specialty you're applying to and then start to focus on those before an interview occurs so that you know you understand what it is that they're concerned about they're concerned about your interaction right they want to make sure that you're real um, they're concerned about uh, you know how did you treat our our, uh, our, our physicians but at the same time our, our other house staff uh, you know, our, our non-physician, non-MD, um, non-healthcare providers, administrative assistants, how did you treat all of them? What was the feedback from the residents? What was the feedback from the dinner that you just went to? Uh, and then uh, you want to send a thank you postcard. I like postcards. Um, I like thank you cards. I like thank you notes in, you know, like a papyrus um, card and then just, you know, handwritten thank you, something personal about them. When you go to the interview, grab their postcard, uh, their business card and just write something personal behind it that you had a conversation with and then so when you go back home everything is going to feel just everything's going to mush together and it's going to be really hard to to remember all well, what happened with every single one of the interviews uh, and so by looking at those business cards i just spend a couple minutes afterwards by writing something special down about your meeting with them and then write a thank you note as a result i like a note i'm not a huge fan when it comes to the thank yous in the form of an email unless they absolutely want email because um, it's very easy to delete email. It's very easy for an email to get missed. So postcard, they have to actually work hard at, at ignoring that or, or even a thank you card. Uh, when you want to contact the programs, you only want to contact them for a, for a really good reason. Do not sound desperate. Um, 
you know, there may be a, a reason where you could do possible short-term observership at that program, but you want to work well in advance uh, of the rank ordered list submission deadline. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about there's going to be a lot more webinars with regards to the 11 factors that determine your chances of matching. Uh, so we want to keep those in mind and uh, and uh, we're going to cover that again in, in, in our next webinar that's coming up. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the post interview feedbacks uh, and uh, and which we're going to cover in a, in a bit. And again, just consider working with AmeriClerkships as your mentor so that we can talk about things. Uh, if you know, interview season is coming up and uh, we do have an interview prep uh, service. It's for anyone that we offer a mock interview or interview boot camp. Uh, it's prepared to help you enter U.S. medical, allopathic or osteopathic, dental, pharmacy or optometry school, residency or fellowship. It's geared towards all those. And uh, your actual residency prep will be personalized to accommodate your field of specialty. And so a mock interview is structured in five phases. You select 10 or 20 questions. Uh, and then, um, and this will be prepared uh, on, uh, you know, when, when you're going to get an orientation, there's going to be a recorded session, uh, there's you're going to go and review it, and then you're going to record a session with myself, and then uh, you'll self review uh, the recording all over again. And then we have boot camps, these are much less structured, they're single recorded 30 or 75 minute sessions with myself, and then I select the questions based on your responses. So it's much more like the the real um, scenario. And then for best outcome, we always recommend that you do you follow the mock interview with an interview bootcamp. So interview bootcamp just a day or two before the actual interview, mock interview, you start about two weeks before the actual interview day occurs. So these are just some of the feedbacks that we received um, after an American Clerkships interview prep. So this was for family medicine residency, and uh, our members said uh, that it was a great interview. Uh, they didn't really ask many questions. It was more conversational. I had three interviews with different faculty. They asked me, tell me about yourself and why did you apply to their program? And then they asked me how I finished my med school being a mother. Interesting. And some random talk. But overall, really nice experience. Rest, the uh, interview prep helped me to gain confidence. Um, and then so they followed back and they said, you know, I'm thinking of sending a thank you note to the program. I had some interactions with and we went back and we uh, responded uh, to that individual. So that's just one feedback. This is another feedback from an internal medicine residency. It kind of gives you an idea of what happens in these uh, residency interviews. Um, this individual said, you know, everything went great. I enjoyed my time in the interview. Faculty member that uh, I didn't know interviewed me after that. I was... Uh, I also met with the program director. They asked the basic questions, including what happened with my step one score. They also gave me uh, vignettes to discuss some possible situations I could have uh, I could have in residency where I used my common sense to answer, and then they uh, asked to expand some things from my CV. I felt prepared, and of course, uh, practicing helped. Um, and then we always ask, you know, what are your recommendations? Um, you know, so their recommendation was uh, that the format to pick the questionnaire is too long because we have about 200 questions that you can pick from. And a lot of people love that, right? Because they get to really understand, wow, there's a lot of these questions that they could ask. And so their suggestion was that, um, you know, it would be really good to have like a recommended set of questions, which we really uh, agreed with and, and we've implemented for this year. Um, and then they believe that the most important uh, thing that they should address is uh, talking about red flags. That's what this individual thought that the mock interview should be focused on. Um, and so, again, just kind of gives you a little bit of an idea. This is about orthodontics residency. Um, it, it, most of you are here because of medical residency, but the idea here is the actual interview. It's an interview for residency. So it's really interesting to, to see it from an orthodontics, a different uh, field of, of healthcare. Um, and so this is what this individual wrote. Uh, thank you for following up with me. I felt pretty well prepared for the interview and answer the questions how uh, we practiced. There were no questions that I felt I could not answer. However, most of the interviews were expressionless and difficult to read as to how they felt about me as a candidate. I met with an instructor and one resident uh, for each 15 minute interview. As I mentioned previously, a current resident was a former classmate. I was able to make contact with him after our mock interview. I also ran into uh, another current resident at this place, JU, and 
that had interviewed with me for residency the year before. I followed up with both of these individuals. After my interview, one of these individuals told me the interviewers asked the current residents about how they felt about the candidates, which happens in residency all the time. The two residents I know spoke good things about me, but said that some of the other residents said I was not a beat enough and gave the example of one of the residents stating that when asked how the interview went, I said it was okay. However, I didn't sleep well. <laughs> the two nights before the interview, so I was tired. I mentioned to you that I am more reserved around new people, but I really tried to push myself out my, outside my comfort zone and meet or introduce myself to as many residents as possible. I gave it my best effort. I did send thank you emails to all of the instructors I interviewed with, the administrative assistant who set up the interviews and the resident who coordinated the social and the PowerPoint presentations for the seminar. Your interview preparation service may be improved by adding a component on interviewing the residents. Thank you again for the advice and insight. Great feedback, great suggestions. We've included that section for this year's mock interview as well. Neurology residency feedback. The interview went well, nothing out of the ordinary questions, just the usual, why, why Nero, why this program, strengths and weaknesses. The interview prep was good. I felt more confident after the mock interview. Thank you for your follow-up. And then another family medicine residency um, uh, follow-up. The interview went great with a few nuances. The um, chief operations asked, uh, the COO, I guess that's the chief operations officer, picked my wife and I up at the airport Wednesday evening and toured us for almost two hours, unannounced, unexpected, but fabulous. Good thing I was reasonably well-dressed and prepared. Wow. Um, interview day began with writing treatment plans and assessments and writing on three patient cases, including medication changes and management. After these, there were three 35-minute interview back-to-back. -back. The third one with the chief um, CIO. I'm not sure exactly which chief this is. Um, but uh, uh, was very direct, and here is where the interview prep really helped. There was one hour group the ethics exercise moderated by behavioral health and um, a PC. I'm not sure what PC stands for. I apologize, we just literally copy and paste the feedback here. And then lunch was with the team and most interviewers, and then two hours of tour with a final group exit interview and a hug from the program coordinator. That's probably what it is, program coordinator. Uh, I would not have done nearly so well without the prep, so thank you again for everything. So, um, yeah, it's time for a question and answer session, and uh, Mr. Zellinger is going to take it from here. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Rizzoni, for walking us through that presentation. Um, it doesn't look like I've gotten any questions in the chat window on the right, so if you do have any questions that you would like to ask Dr. Rizzoni and myself, regarding mock match interviews in general or just interviews uh, as they come, go ahead and type them out on the right there so we can answer them for you. Um, just a couple of quick points before we get to the Q&A section. Uh, we do have a couple other services I wanna to quickly touch on now that we are in the you know post September 15th part of the ERAS season. If you still are looking to you know get a letter of recommendation from an attending physician and you're waiting on it for some reason or another, uh, there are LOR services that we provide here that can help you out a little bit when it comes to creating a new LOR for that attending position if they do require you to draft one on your own. We also have current promotions that are active regarding our upcoming clinical sites and other career development services we'll be offering. So make sure to keep checking that out uh, every so often as we do change it around roughly every two weeks or so. Uh, our interview prep packages are also live. If you want to take a look at the different packages that we do offer with different combinations of services with myself, Dr. Mazzani, or just individually with Dr. Mazzani, if you feel uncomfortable right before an interview and it's a couple days away and you just need to get something in with Dr. Mazzani to get a quick touch up, we do offer those services uh, expedited up to, you know, even the day before your interview if we need to get that done. So let us know what your needs are. We'd be more than happy to accommodate them for you. Um, if you do need to some general clarifications on, you know, any of the, our other resources, if you want to get some background knowledge on residency applications in general, how to proceed through the match, we do have our uh, interview prep in the residency prep section of our Merit Clerkships uh, Academy, which is something that is a collection of resources that is for members uh, only. And if you go through our academy as a member, you can go and get many different resources on how to best select programs, how to prepare for interviews, how to really optimize other aspects of your application if you haven't applied yet. So make sure you check out our resources down there at the link provided. Again, we're gonna be covering this YouTube 
uh, presentation in a YouTube premiere on Friday. If you want to watch it again, or if your friend wants to watch it, or whatever reason, you can go ahead and chime in and ask Dr. Masani more questions at the chat window during that premiere. And then it'll be posted on our YouTube channel indefinitely. So you can come back and rewatch it as many times as you like. And again, Dr. Masani touched on this at the beginning of the webinar, but we do have another webinar on what to do when waiting on residencies to respond uh, to, your, uh, to your application and what to do in the meantime when you're following up. So um, with all that being said, I do want to start addressing some questions. Again, I haven't gotten any chat questions, so please go ahead and type out any chat questions here on the right side of the screen. Dr. Mazzani and I will be more than happy to answer any questions you may have about your personal situation, about anything that uh, you know you might be troubling, uh, might be troubling you as you approach the residency uh, session. Uh, just let us know, and we'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Yeah, we have some, uh, we actually have uh, uh, several other questions that were asked during the, the registration phase, and I think a lot of them are are, are really, really good. Uh, so Mrs. Ellinger, go ahead and uh, grab those. Uh, but I'm looking at the registration question. One of the questions is responding to interviewers who did not read your application. What do you do? Um, what a great question. Well, I think it would uh, really depend on, um, on what the scenario is. And I think in this situation, I do understand what the scenario is. Uh, the individual, um, I believe, uh, who's asking this question had been a former resident and she was still invited for an interview. And so she would be considered a residency re-entry. And, and those individuals are, it's, it's, it's a different way that, that those applications have to be, um, have to be treated. And so, um, our member was under the impression that, that you know, and we, we did, it was very, very clear all over the application that she had been in a residency program before, but even though she had disclosed that all over the application, she still went there and, and some of the interviewers did not know about that at all. And um, so just to give you a little bit of background on how these, uh, these interviews are, sometimes the interviewers are selected. Uh, a lot of times there's a, there's a roster and just like clinicals, the individuals that are supposed to be there, uh, preceptors, the interviewers, uh, don't show up, or there's an emergency, or they get called away, or there's a call, you know? So uh, so, so they bring in backups, and these backups could be PGY1s, PGY2s, that are literally walking in the hallway, and the coordinator says, are you doing anything? Uh, you have 10 minutes, come on in, I need you to interview someone. And that's it. So sometimes it works like that. And and they would have no idea about the application. So that's one type of interviewer that does not know anything about your, your application. The other type is if the program sounds like they have no idea about a red flag of yours. It could be residency in the past. It could be multiple attempts. It could be that, you know, they thought that you graduated two years ago, but you graduated 20 years ago, all sorts of things. And really, the, 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 every scenario is, is different, the way that you got to deal with it. Uh, I think you got to just be patient. Don't get upset. Just because you apply doesn't mean the entire system is aware of every nuance about your application. And spend just a little bit of time, the same way as you did in your personal statement, to explain that red flag just really quickly. And maybe you say, you look a little bit surprised. Is there any particular question I can answer for you? And then you let them ask you, and then you go back to all of the strategy sessions that we had and how we responded to really tough questions and try to touch upon it and, and, and kind of calm them down a bit that way. So um, hopefully that's, that, was, uh, that was helpful. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Dr. Mizani. Uh, as you were going through that, uh, we did have a couple questions here in the chat window I want to go ahead and jump on. Uh, this question is regarding your graduation, and uh, this is something that you can probably speak to, Dr. Mazzani, in terms of if your application might be filtered out, whether by your test scores or some other factor. If you feel like that is a possibility that your application is going to be filtered out because of some kind of red flag, uh, should you approach programs and let them know about your strengths, your weaknesses, or anything else that uh, might change their mind and might give them an interview? Is there anything that you can provide guidance on in this situation? Sure. One of the common issues is uh, failure in a USMLE. And so if you were one of those members that decided to apply without having had passed that USMLE when you did apply to programs, because in your mind, it was more important to apply on the 15th. And maybe we both agree that it was you know, more important for you to apply on the 15th than to 
wait for a particular exam. Uh, so if that was the case, then then as soon as that examination is passed, then you want to immediately contact every single one of the programs and let them know this exam was passed. Uh, so that way you kind of beat them to the punch of them rejecting you because of them thinking that you applied prematurely, knowing that you did not pass an exam, and then you're asking them to give up a very, very expensive interview slot. So that's one. The other is, let's say that you passed up one, two CK and CS, but you've had multiple attempts in the previous ones, even a one extra attempt. And in that case, it's probably a good idea for you to pass step three, because, you know, yeah, so it is anywhere between, you know, just a single digit percentage of program directors that look for step three, maybe up to a quarter of the program directors, depending on the specialty, but the importance level is pretty low. But for those that, that see multiple attempts, previous attempts in your in, in a portfolio and and they see that step three is also passed, then their concerns about you being licensed goes down significantly. Because that's really what they're really concerned about is if you've had multiple attempts at the USMLEs, you know, pre before pre three then maybe you'll have a failure on step three and then you will never be licensed. Then what's the point of doing residency? And so that's what they're concerned about. So if you've had step three pass and you did that after you submitted your application, you can call them and you can um, let them know that, uh, that that was passed. Another thing that you could do to improve your chances a bit, again, these are all going to be covered in our, um, in our next uh, session. Um, uh, I'm just going to give you this one. I'm not going to give any more away. There's a lot more, but I'm not going to give any more away. Another thing that you could also do is uh, kind of update them uh, about your letter of recommendation if you got any new ones in since you applied, um, or if a new letter of recommendation was just uploaded, certainly you can contact them and tell them that. But that's all I'm going to say. I don't want to give away the next uh, the presentation in 10 days from now. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Zai. Yeah. Um, we had another uh, good question here on just how to address uh, or actually, well, the first question that was asked is, when do we expect interviews? And I can actually answer this question. Uh, typically speaking, interviews are handed out in the months of uh, September and October. About 18% of interviews are handed out in September. About 47% are handed out in October. And the interviews are actually conducted mostly in November, December, and January. So this information comes from the NRMP program director survey. It breaks it down by month and the percentage is based on each month. So realistically, only about 18% of interviews will be handed out in September. So if you haven't heard back by the end of September, know that the vast majority of interviews are handed out in October. I should say the vast plurality of interviews are handed out in October, about 47% of them. So you should be accommodating your schedule though around November, December, and January. Those are the months that most interviews do take place. And that's something Dr. Mazzani and I do always advise to keep in mind is that these interviews do require you to travel in many situations. It will require some expenses. So make sure you're budgeting and planning accordingly for November, December, and January. All those months are months where most of the interviews are being covered. About, again, 31% November, 33% December, 23% in January. So keep in mind, uh, keep that in mind. It may change a little bit this year, but in past years, that's typically how we see the numbers break down. And that, that, uh, correlates really well with October 1st, which is the MSPE release date, which is a pretty big deal, really big deal. To some specialties, MSPE is more important than USMLE scores. And that's according to the NRMP program director survey. Uh, not according to Mazzani, it's according to NRMP program director survey. No. Um, so yeah, uh, good. So, um, uh, so we asked some of our members, and, and you, you probably remember this, about uh, sharing some of your past residency interview experiences and any concerns that you may want us to address. So uh, one of our members shared, and these are really good, uh, they said that uh, the program asked some about questions about future plans. I was interviewing at a community program, so I tried to keep it simple, but it came across as me not being ambitious enough. Hmm, really interesting. Next thing that they were asked is uh, if they were asked about their weakness, that you're gonna be asked that, uh, that's, gonna, that's gonna happen. And then if you were asked about an interesting patient, uh, so those are really good feedbacks. Of course, we're not going to be able to cover every single one of these, but these are really good feedbacks for, for us to keep in mind about how a residency interview um, would be like. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Mazzani. And that is, uh, that is something that I do want to make sure in the chat window over here. There are a couple questions that you everybody's asking for feedback on, how best to answer them. 
And I do want to cover uh, you know, one or two of them with Dr. Mazzani, but I want to point out there is no one size fits all way to address a certain question. For example, why did, what, what happened with your scores? Or you know, why is your date of graduation so late? What's taken so long to apply? Questions like that are going to be subjective. You are gonna to have to craft your own uh, you know, background and experiences to answer that question. So Dr. Mazzani and I typically won't give out general advice like that because it's so particular to your individual situation. But uh, you know, if you do have questions specifically about how to answer a question, we can absolutely do that with you in an office hour or in another webinar uh, that you know, me and Dr. Mazzani will work with you on in terms of interview questions. So just keep that in mind. Uh, Dr. Mazzani, we did get a really good question here in the chat uh, regarding second looks. So uh, what do programs take from applicants who come for second looks? Some programs say this does not factor into your ranking. They're just for you to get a better idea of the program. Do you think this is true? Can you address uh, second looks in general? I love second looks. I think second looks are great. Um, it is Second looks are so powerful that uh, certain programs uh, have prohibited their, their teams from offering second looks. Um, look, at the end of the day, we're all human, uh, and our opinions do get biased. Uh, and the more we see someone and we really like them and they show their initiative, the more we may be more attracted to have them join our, our team. So I think that if you're a, if you're personable, if you're really strong in your clinical abilities, and if um, you going back there for a second look is not going to make you look like you're overselling yourself, but rather you're, um, you're, you're, you're really interested and you're trying to compare between programs so that you can have a better rank order list, but you're really interested in them and you really appreciate that opportunity for them to come, for them to allow you to come back. Um, so I think that is really good. Second looks can take you know many different shapes and forms. And um, and I think uh, you know they could be done by video conference, it could be done by uh, maybe a short term observership, it could be done by uh, it could be done by you going back over there, just meeting with the coordinator. It could be done by the program director inviting you to come back and just meeting with them directly. Um, we've had many of our members uh, match after second looks. So I think that is pretty powerful, but don't be surprised if a program says we're not allowed to do it or, um, or you know, we don't offer second looks, but don't let that discourage you. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Dr. Mazzani. Um, there are a couple questions in the registration questions I do want to address here. Uh, I think we've addressed most of the chat questions, but if you have more questions, please type them out in the chat window. This was the question that really stood out to me, Dr. Mazzani. Um, how do you prepare for an interview with friends or how do you prepare for uh, what we uh, sometimes call a courtesy interview? Can you address that? Uh -huh. Yes, um, it's one of the best and the worst things that could happen to you, uh, courtesy interviews, uh, which is, which is probably a little bit different. Um, there's different ways of meeting with friends, right? It could be somebody that you know, it could be a friend of a friend, it could be an actual friend of yours that is a part of an interview panel uh, that is also interviewing you, which hopefully, I mean, that would be a conflict of interest. So hopefully they will pull that person out unless they have no idea. Most of the programs do know, but they don't really look at it as conflict of interest because it's so common for a, a current resident from a particular school to recommend uh, other candidates from his or her school to the program and bring them on. So sometimes you'll notice, you know, when you see a program has so many residents from particular schools, because that's because of their own strong networking and they keep bringing back their own alumni and, uh, and they get in. So, so it's, it's, um, it's frowned upon, but it's not really frowned upon from our perspective, though, courtesy interview, that specific courtesy interview, if it's, if it's provided to you as a result of somebody doing somebody else a favor, that is not usually good because if it was, if you didn't get the interview through natural selection, right? If you didn't get it through natural selection, meaning it didn't go through the coordinator taking a look at it, or it didn't go through two of the three committee members looking at your application packing and saying, yes, this person should come. Then what's going to happen is the person who gave you, who, who conducted your courtesy interview, which is most likely the program director, probably trying to do his or her friend a favor, um, then that individual needs to take that application. If he likes your interview, that individual needs to take your application package and hand it over to the rest of the admission committee. So then you're back to square one again, right? So at that point, then you have to, um, you have to be able to, the application has to be able to defend itself. So, uh, but if you are in a scenario like that, you, um, 
I mean, I don't think you treat that any different than you would do a regular interview. Don't be buddy buddies with them, especially if they are your buddy. Just answer the question very um, normally as if you would do anybody else. And if you're really close to that person, then just let them know, look, I, I know what a tough situation you're in. I'm here for a job. I'm not here as your friend. I'm here for a job. I want to be compared to the rest of your candidates the exact same way. I don't want you to do any favors for me. Um, and you know, if I, you know, if you ask me a question and if you don't like my answer, then please tell me. Uh, or you don't have to tell me. It's totally okay. I just want you to treat me the same as as anybody else. Uh, so that's it, if you're really, really close to that individual. So hopefully that answers your question. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Mazzani. Yeah. Um, there is another registry. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Mazzani. Yeah, there is one question uh, one individual asks is, when should I expect my first interview? You did ask that question. And then I also asked, what should I expect in my first interview? Um, <clears throat> everything we covered in this presentation, of course, you should expect. However, the one thing you should expect is expect not to do so well, right? Or expect that you go there and you feel overjoyed about how well you did, which is probably not true either. So um, when you go to your interview, expect to be exhausted the first day. Make sure you go there the night before, then fly in just a couple of hours before the, the interview. Flights delay all the time, and that's the one meeting you do not want to be late for. So plan to go there the night before. The night before, drive around and find out exactly where you're supposed to park. Um, and that's if there's not a dinner. Some, a lot of these interviews have dinner beforehand because they want to see the social side of you. Uh, really important, right? And uh, and then just get there about 30, 45 minutes earlier the, the morning of so that you don't feel rushed, your heart rate isn't at 150, you know, so that you can be relaxed, uh, you know, chill, you just go and start the interview and be yourself. Absolutely. And I do want to uh, piggyback on that. I know there were some questions about scheduling and things like that. Dr. Mazzani just addressed that. But when it comes to planning out your route ahead of time, make sure you anticipate what time of day it is. It's a big difference. For example, if you have an interview in New York, and it's Friday and it's eight o'clock in the morning and you're trying to get into the city and you're staying outside of the city. It's a big difference then as opposed to maybe checking your time and checking the commute around 2 p.m. or something like that. So really try to anticipate those and really don't make sure that you're not late to this important, uh, very, very important interview. And private transportation is probably the way to go here. Um, Dr. Mazzani and I always swear by that. And especially when it comes to interviews, you do want to make sure that you're getting to the interview, you're parking ahead of time, you're not rushed, you're not running to catch a train or a bus in an area you're not familiar with. So an Uber, a Lyft, some kind of ride sharing is usually your best bet. If you do want to drive yourself, a rental car, of course, is something to take a look at. But I know in the past, some members have used Turo. That's a new uh, ride sharing app where uh, car uh, car owners actually uh, you know rent their cars out for short periods of time. That could be something to look at. But Public transportation is just not the best way to get to an interview. So many things can go wrong. So many things can possibly break down. Be very wary of that when you're going to an interview. All right, um, Dr. Rizani, this is another good question. Um, I don't want to address it specifically uh, for the specialty that was asked here, but in general, um, how do you prepare for specialty, specialty specific interviews? For example, how do you prepare for a psych interview versus a family medicine interview? versus an internal medicine uh, interview, what factors should you look for uh, when it comes to those specialties? All right, well, um, that's a tough question because uh, usually uh, the, if you really committed to a specialty, then you would feel pretty confident going into that interview and you're not gonna, you're not gonna really have much of an issue trying to explain why you want to be a family physician or, or why you, you picked the specialty that you did. Um, it becomes problematic, it becomes challenging for you to just you know uh, juggle between two specialties if you apply to multiple specialties. But one of the best ways to prepare for any interview, which we do a lot in our interview prep, is why did you apply to this specialty? And then try to work backwards, we'll go back into it and try to find history in, in your background. We try to find particular points, five, six, seven, eight points that, that you know, confirms that this is the reason why you're interested in the specialty. Uh, we'll really take a look at your personal statement and then we try to bring that in. Consistency is the key, but really it goes back to the clinical experiences that you've done, what specialties that you've done, where your, who your letter writers are, the same way and reasons that you were building your commitment to a specialty, the same way you gotta be consistent and do the same thing in the interview, but now you gotta talk about it. Right. So American just won't be there to really make everything kind of look OK on paper with you. But that's the reason why we also kept you involved. 
right? That's why all these office hours are there because I want to, that's where the letters of recommendation, we wanted to make sure you come in and you, you see how we analyze things. Your MSP, how does it get analyzed? Office hours, how do we ask questions? Sometimes I'm a little bit more harsh with certain members because I want you to feel what it's like when you're in an interview so you don't, you don't, you know, you don't break down when something like that happens. So there's always a strategy. There's a method to this madness because when you get to the interview, I want to make sure that you're strong and you're confident and you can, you can respond to the questions regardless of how they twist it. So, um, so that's how you really would, would, would prepare uh, foundation regardless of the specialty. It's really the same, going back to your experience, drawing conclusions specific to that specialty and bringing them in. Um, easier said than done though, I, I get it. I, I agree. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Rosani. Um, all right, we did get a few other chats here. Uh, this this question came up a lot of times, Dr. Rosani. Um, date of graduation, I think that, that came up the most here in the chat, just how to address it, what to watch out for when it comes to that. I think that's a good one to quickly address. And um, if you're asked about your date of graduation, if it's outside either the program's range or if there's something wrong in terms of the gap, how do you address that particular question? What's your strategy there? I mean, look, if there's a gap, we try to ask you during our sessions about why is there a gap, right? We really try it multiple ways. And if you have a gap, we need to talk about it now. I, that's not something I can answer here, right? That wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do justice for that question. Mm -hmm. So. Every gap is caused by a different reason. Some of us have really good reasons for our gaps. Some of us have horrible reasons for our gaps. Well, either way, we gotta talk about it. So the one thing you wanna do is you don't wanna ignore it, right? That's why we try not to ignore it. So as we put your application together, we try not to ignore it. As we talk with you, try not to ignore it. And every one of your strategy sessions, I've spoken with you, we discuss your gaps. So if you have a particular gap, uh, and if we have not discussed it, Come on over, we gotta discuss it, but don't be afraid of it, right? It's in your history, don't ignore it, don't deny it. You you gotta own it, you gotta be accountable for it, but we gotta see what you've, how you pulled yourself out of there um, and, and how did you become a stronger person afterwards. So um, it's, um, you know, it, it's gonna be independent, individually based, uh, how, we, how we address that. Absolutely, thanks Dr. Mazzani. Yeah. Um, there's one last question answered, uh, asked in the chat that I do want us to address. Uh, what's the best way to talk about your U.S. clinical experience? I mean, for example, what's the best way to talk about your American clinical rotations or something similar to it? How is the best way to insert that into an interview? Uh, I think there's a lot of, you know, you got to take multiple advantages of, of, of an opportunity to talk about your clinical experiences. Uh, I think, um, uh, you know, tell me about yourself is one. Uh, why did you apply to this specialty is another, you know, I, I applied because, you know, my background and I came to the United States and I did so many weeks of internal medicine. This is why I did it. This is how it went. Uh, I think you got to talk about it during your weakness. Maybe that's a great time to talk about your clinical experience. Uh, you know, I, you know, when I, when I was thinking about the specialty, uh, you know, obviously I did a lot of it in so-and-so country, but when I came here, I really felt that that was, that was a weakness of mine where I didn't see internal medicine as it's practiced here in the U.S. So I did so many X weeks of clinicals. What are your strengths? You use it there as well. But again, you want to be methodical about it. You don't want to sound um, too rehearsed and just every single question. You want to talk about clinicals, right? You probably want to talk about it maybe 20% of the questions, but then you want to probably end it with, you know, reminding them about your clinical strength rather than talking about things that they really don't care about. Um, you know, so, um, so those are those are the um, that's how I would I would really approach it. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Dr. Mazzani. You're welcome. Right. Um, that addresses, I think, uh, all the questions in the chat window. So, Dr. Mazzani, if you have any uh, final thoughts for us or anything else you want to cover, uh, go ahead. Yes, um, I am trying to find you all uh, an article that we had published uh, about um, about the different structures of. HC Pro about the structures of interviews. There's about 23 different structures across uh, the country, and uh, and I'm and I need to find that. And once we do, maybe I'll share it in our next webinar. That's what I'll do. I'll share it in our next webinar, uh, and we'll certainly share it with you um, before your interview prep if you decide to move forward with us. But just keep us in mind. We love interview prep. This is this is it. This is what we work for. We love to prepare you for that interview. So it's, it's half the battle getting this.
interviews. But really, those inter the actual interviews are are what um, what really you put your best foot forward, and, and we love to be there with you. So um, yeah, nothing more from me to say. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for your patience while we started, and see you in about ten days on our next webinar. Uh, what do you do while you wait for residency programs to respond? Thanks for your time, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Bye bye.